Hi everyone, welcome to week 9 of Health Policy and Health Systems. This lecture is just a brief overview of Chapter 8. Um, as we've stated before, please work on your draft papers this week. There's no discussion assignment, so you can just focus on writing your draft papers. And if you have any questions that uh, you want to ask us, send us an email anytime. Alright, this chapter focuses on health economics and it just gives you the basics of health economics. It's not really meant to go in depth and I'll just point out a few uh, examples and sort of elaborate a bit on uh, some of the basic concepts here. So the chapter covers economic decision making and it talks about this notion that all people are really trying to get the most pleasure out of life and uh, pleasure and uh, as described by econ economists, is called utility. So there's something called utility theory. Those of you who've taken basic economics courses, macroeconomics or microeconomics, know that there's utility theory out there. And the idea is that people all over the world uh, strive to try to make themselves happy. So they do whatever it takes to make themselves uh, feel good. Uh, and given that there are scarce resources on the planet, so we only have one planet to begin with and everything on that planet um, uh, is uh, scarce, is finite uh, for the most part. So uh, we have to um, figure out efficient ways to divide up the resources that we have uh, without uh, killing each other. And obviously that is one approach that some people try to use, but uh, that's not the approach we use in a civil society. All right, so now demand, your book uh, talks about the notion of demand. Demand is really just, you know, people's desire uh, for uh, goods, but it's not just a desire because it's tied to price. So you can desire lots of things. Like you can say, you know, I really want to be um, um, president of the United States, right? Well, what would you be willing to give up? in order to become president of the United States. That's how you assess demand. So uh, if you really want a car or a certain type, you really want um, a new Cadillac, right? Uh, then how much would you be willing to pay for that new Cadillac? And, uh, you know, obviously businesses try to assess what the demand is, what the market will bear, and they charge certain prices based on how much someone really wants something. And as you know, it really doesn't depend on the size or shape of it. It's really just psychological in many ways, uh, and it's what we place value on. So you can have one object that really has the same function, uh, a pair of jeans, and it can vary in price tremendously uh, depending on how people, what people what value people place on them. So it's really a psychological notion in many ways. There are a variety of factors that affect demand. Um, quality is a big one for healthcare. So if you think you're going to get higher quality of care, you're usually willing to pay a little more for it. Of course, your income affects what you can demand. If you have no money, you can't really demand much. All right, elasticity. So elasticity is a basic, again, uh, economics concept, and it can be linked to healthcare too. It refers to this notion that um, your demand for something uh, can impact the price of it. So as demand goes up for something, usually the price goes up. And as demand goes down, usually the price goes down. Why? Because a business is trying to sell something to you. So if there are a lot of people standing outside who want iPhones, as there have been uh, lately, then the price of the iPhone is going to go up, right? It, because you only have a limited number of iPhones. So you can charge more if there's a greater demand for it. People are going to be willing to pay more because they have to compete with all these other people to get it. So the same thing for healthcare. If you have some good uh, that's fairly scarce, for example, we, we've been having drug shortages lately. So if you know you're having drug shortages then, and you're producing that drug, then you can probably charge a little more for that drug, right? Unless there's something to stop you from doing that. And we'll talk about that in a second. So how does health insurance impact demand? Well, what's interesting about healthcare is that we have three parties involved in decision making. It's not just you and the uh, supplier of the good or service. So it's not just you and the doctor or you and a pharmaceutical company, but the uh, insurance company is somehow involved in what you can receive. You give them money and they determine what they're going to pay for with the money you've given them. And they also determine if you need to pay some of the money. So if you have co-pay or co-insurance. Now, because of that, people don't feel 
all of the costs that are incurred when they purchase health care goods and services. So when you go to the doctor, you may pay $10, but the visit may actually cost $100. You might feel a bit different about that visit to the doctor, and you might demand more if you knew that you were paying $100, or if you knew you were paying even more money, right, $400, $500. As if the insurance keeps covering everything, uh, then it gives you this false perception that things are cheaper than they are. And so that's called a moral hazard. The idea that people are willing to take risks because they don't feel actually the costs that are being incurred. So if your parents pay for your entire life, then you're going to take more risk and, and go out and get all kinds of things as long as your parents are going to pay for it because you're not feeling how much it costs right like if you have some food in the house your kids might go through and eat all the food uh, because they know that they're not paying for it so they're going to do things uh, that you wouldn't do because you actually have to pay for food right so they're willing to take a risk that you're not going to take supply um, you know it's fairly straightforward it really refers to you know, certain goods out there, they're being produced, and again, they're being sold at a certain price, so we can dictate, you know, the meaning of supply by, again, looking at this uh, numerical figure of price. Uh, so, people are willing to make something and then offer it at a certain price, and obviously their goal is to make profit. Uh, supply is affected by a number of factors. Um, you know, sell price based on how much people are willing to pay. That can determine how much a manufacturer can produce. Input costs, and this is something that's talked about a lot in healthcare, especially in the pharmaceutical industry. The research and development is often used as a reason for the um, the high price of certain drugs. So um, you may hear that uh, it, it takes a lot of research and development to gener and a lot of uh, manufacturing costs to produce biologic drugs so biologics are uh, not not chemical drugs but they're actually produced by uh, biological entities like bacteria for example or uh, uh, some other larger scale organism so uh, because of that they, the manufacturing is much more complex uh, so often uh, manufacturers will say well we have to charge a lot of money for that particular type of drug because of all the research and development, all of the manufacturing costs are involved, so input costs that go into creating it. Well, sometimes manufacturing can change, right? So if you have some uh, evolution in technology where manufacturing costs start to go down, the product should actually cost less, so that can actually affect supply. Um, it can lead to faster production, which means you're going to have more of the thing, more of the good or, or service, usually a good, uh, that you're able to provide, then uh, people can actually uh, get it for a lower price because it's going to be a greater supply. And I also wanted to mention frequency of purchase. Your book doesn't talk about this, but this is something that's somewhat unique to healthcare. It's, it's not completely unique to healthcare, uh, but it's somewhat unique in that for healthcare, you often purchase something not one time, but multiple times. So you might buy drugs every 90 days for a condition that you're going to have for 10 years. So that can affect supply because the manufacturer knows that people are going to be purchasing it for a long period of time. And so they can really prepare to, to uh, they can get investors and they can really prepare to create this really uh, large supply in order to really, you know, crank out those drugs to a lot of different people. And they, can, they know they're going to have a lot of volume. And that can affect supply. All right, so just like there's demand elasticity, there's also supply elasticity. And that refers to the same thing, this notion that the price can affect, you know, the supply that's out there. So if you're paying more for something, then that money then can be used to, to generate more of it. If you're paying less for something, it, it may be more difficult uh, to actually generate that good. Uh, but so the... The supply can be affected uh, by price, but sometimes supply is not affected by price. And also, I, I didn't I didn't mention that, but sometimes demand is not so affected by uh, price either. And often, uh, the demand for drugs is said to be inelastic, which means that people will demand a particular drug because they need it and because they have a certain condition, and they really don't care what price it is. So you can. A drug that costs ten dollars uh, can be pushed up to a price of one hundred dollars, and many people will still try to get it if it's 
a drug that they think will actually improve their health and keep them going and keep them alive. So people are willing to make some fairly high sacrifices uh, in healthcare that they don't make in other industries because they're trying to continue to live, right? Okay, um, some of the factors that uh, really can uh, uh, are, are really relevant uh, to supply are just this notion that uh, suppliers are trying to provide uh, the good at a certain price that will maximize their profits, right? So that's the same thing for, um, this applies to a, a good or a service. So if you are a practitioner offering your services, you're trying to maximize profits. If you're a supplier, like a, a drug manufacturer, you're also trying to maximize profits. So you're going to do things and you're incentivized to behave in a certain way that will lead to maximizing your profits. And that goes back to the initial point that uh, I started this mini lecture with, that uh, people are trying to maximize their utility, so they're trying to get as much pleasure, as much satisfaction as possible, and in this case, satisfaction is described as profit. So if you're a business entity, your goal is to keep your business going, right, and make it as strong as possible and make it grow and uh, try to uh, you know, expand in various ways. So you're trying to maximize profit because the more money you're bringing in, be beyond your uh, costs, then you can now bank that money and do all kinds of things with it, all right? So, um, so profit matters, and profit uh, impacts a lot of behavior uh, in the healthcare industry just like any other industry. All right, now, um, one of the ideal goals of, uh, of uh, um, a well-organized e economy is to reach a point of equilibrium for various products and services where demand starts to match supply. That's really the an ideal situation. It's also not the case that demand matches supply, but that's really um, sort of a goal of a market is to be at that point. And when markets are functioning really well, uh, you can get really close to that point of equilibrium. I mean, there are definitely some markets that uh, function uh, at that level. For example, there are some commodities that sometimes reach that level, like uh, like bananas or apples and that kind of thing. Many times, the market is actually priced exactly exactly at the point at which people are demanding that particular good and the supply is appropriate for the demand that exists and so um, it, it can happen but it's it's fairly ideal and definitely doesn't happen on a regular basis in healthcare. All right. Okay so a little more on health insurance um, as I said before there are financial incentives in place and those incentives can actually impact the way providers behave. So health insurers can create relationships with providers that can incentivize them to do certain things. Obviously, if a health insurer is trying to make money, they're going to do things that um, uh, prevent the provider from spending too much money. And now, why is the provider so important in healthcare? Because they, they are the gateway to the goods and services that patients need. As you see, I've written here, the most expensive tool in medicine is the doctor's pen. Uh, that's, a, that's a common uh, statement uh, that's made about doctors in relation to, uh, in, in terms of their uh, role in the uh, e economics of healthcare uh, and their role in determining uh, uh, what the healthcare costs are going to be for any given patient. So. Uh, the way doctors think and uh, the, the restrictions that are put on how they're behaving uh, can really impact the costs for the patient and, of course, for the insurer because the insurer is usually covering most of what the uh, patient uh, needs. So the one question is whether or not the doctor is making good decisions. Is the doctor making decisions that are valuable and useful to the patient or is the doctor making decisions that are going to put money in the doctor's pocket? Because the doctor, again, is also trying to maximize profits. So um, the insurance companies try to come up with arrangements that will incentivize doctors to uh, not overspend uh, but at the same time, you don't want doctors to underspend either because if they underspend and they don't provide people with appropriate care, then that means people are going to be unhealthy, which means the insurance company will then have to pay more money for them. So it's a really tricky balance of trying to make sure doctors don't over-prescribe, over-treat, but also don't under-treat. And they've got it really, 
insurance companies have to negotiate with them so that they can get it just right. And so that's why also doctors who are uh, sh who should be big advocates for their patients have to fight to make sure the negotiations are appropriate so that they have they are receiving appropriate reimbursement. And that's why you see doctors fighting for. A higher reimbursement or a certain level of reimbursement all the time uh, because they're trying to make sure that this balance is maintained so that they are being paid appropriately to provide certain services uh, that people need and that they don't have to um, try to increase the volume of patients and, and give people unnecessary things in order to um, uh, really meet uh, the requirements of their business model and uh, make enough revenue to cover their costs. Okay, so um, your book talks about some different types of markets. I think two of the most relevant ones are monopolies for healthcare because because of the patents on a variety of products, companies have a monopoly when they get a patent. So if you have a patent on a new drug that was created or a new device, then other people, of course, can't actually market uh, that particular uh, drug or device. They can make it, but they can't take it out there and sell it. They can just sort of keep it and uh, wait until the patent expires and then start producing it. And there's a you know, whole set of laws that relate to that and so on, but that's beyond the scope of this course. Um, and then there are oligopolies uh, where you have certain big players that really dominate the industry. And this is really where we are now in the insurance industry. If you, Some of you may have already read about this, that uh, there are a number of insurance companies that are acquiring, num sorry, a number of large insurance companies that are acquiring small insurance companies. And we essentially have uh, an insurance oligopoly in our country now. So there are some insurers that everyone knows about, and they really have the majority of the market, like Aetna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, Cigna and so on. Uh, the market really is not, um, uh, it's, it's definitely not a perfect market now and uh, there's just not enough competition uh, to offer people a variety of products. So most of what people are, are being offered these days is, is fairly similar uh, in terms of what the kind of uh, insurance they can get through their employer because of this oligopoly that has taken place over time. Now, um, your book points out that healthcare is can be described as a, a monopolistically competitive market, and that's because you have a lot of these dominant players and some of the smaller players out there too. Um, but the dominant players have most of the market power, with smaller players having uh, just a little bit of market power. And that, that's even the case for healthcare providers too. That you have some big healthcare providers, like some large hospital. Uh, groups, and then you have uh, still small practices that don't have much power at all. And there's actually been a decline in the number of uh, private practices um, in the country because the larger players are really just starting to buy up the private practices, just like insurers are buying up, uh, some big insurers are buying up smaller insurers. And these two things actually go hand in hand because. Those two groups, if you think about it, those two groups negotiate with each other. So um, if insurers become larger, then health providers have to become larger too in order to have actually uh, uh, more bargaining power. Because insure, a large insurer negotiating with a small practice, let's say, of 10 doctors, is, is the insurer is always going to have more bargaining power, right? They're going to be able to drive down the uh, the reimbursement levels that they're going to pay those providers, and they're going to bas basically be able to nickel and dime them, uh, nickel and dime them in a lot of different ways uh, that will be possibly harmful to that practice. But if you now take that same small practice and you turn them into a massive healthcare system of uh, you know, uh, 10,000 doctors and all kinds of other uh, health providers, and you have them negotiate with a large insurance company, the rates are going to be much better because that, though, all of those health providers bring a lot of patients and a lot of beneficiaries, and the insurance company is going to want those. So your, your bargaining power is much stronger. So that's why we really have these oligopolies forming, and uh, your book would describe it as a monopolistically competitive market. So there's competition, but... Uh, you know, it's competition among a few large players for the most part. And then there's a lot of little small players with small market share. 
Um, your book also points out that, and I mentioned this earlier, that the uh, typical market transaction that takes place between a consumer and a supplier, let's say, um, you go to um, you go to your local store and you buy something. Let's say you go to a, a clothing store and you buy some clothes at a local clothing store, and they are the people who make the clothes too. And so they're selling you these clothes at a certain price, and you're just trying to figure out, well, do I want to pay a certain amount or not? Um, you don't have an insurance company uh, around to tell you, well, you can have the blue shirt, but you can't have the white shirt. Uh, or if you buy the blue shirt, you have, you have to pay a copay of $10. If you buy the white shirt, you have to pay uh, $5. So now you figure out which one uh, is going to be appropriate based on the amount of money you have to pay. Uh, that's essentially what insurance companies end up doing uh, with their uh, beneficiaries. So they interfere with all kinds of decisions. Uh, and, and they should because um, they, again, have to maximize their profit. And if they... Uh, lose money and uh, become insolvent, then you would have no insurance, and that wouldn't help you very much with it. So they have to make these kind of really tough calls in order to uh, make sure that they're providing uh, the service that you want uh, and that they can stay afloat. But uh, the interference of that third party really does change how we think about uh, the interaction between the consumer and the supplier in healthcare. And your book also talks some about market failures. Um, we pretty much have most types of market failures in the um, healthcare system. And these common reasons that are listed for market failures, uh, almost all of them apply uh, to healthcare in the U.S. because it's really um, just sort of full of different market problems uh, that exist because of the different types of insurers we have, the, um, the oligopolies that exist, and so on. So we have a concentration of market power. We have imperfect information because health providers have much more information than consumers have. That's changing some now because of the internet, but the information is still imperfect. And uh, even if you come in with internet information, when you're talking with your doctor, the doctor, um, unless you bring in some information from some authoritative site and you point out uh, exactly what your your thoughts are based on that uh, information, the doctor may not be so interested in listening to what you pull off the internet. Uh, they're more likely to listen to their own training and whatever other sources of information uh, they, they use and rely on. Um, we definitely have consumption of public goods. There are a number of uh, goods uh, in healthcare that are public. Uh, um, not not a lot, uh, but but there are definitely uh, goods that are public uh, that we provide uh, to certain individuals, or they're they're close to being public, like certain some vaccines that are essentially uh, free to uh, certain groups of people. All right, then uh, externalities. These are things that are essentially uh, external that somehow harm the market, and, and we have lots of those, and one is uh, the insurers and uh, their role in the market. So how do you address some of these market failures? Again, this is, this is what health policy does, and this is basically what happens in America. All of these do. So government financing, we have government financing, clearly, uh, that helps provide goods to people. Um, and, um, you know, we do have some goods that are public. Um, government increases uh, taxes. So uh, clearly we're all being taxed in order to pay for Medicare and Medicaid. So that's happening. Uh, regulatory mandates. We have regulations ad nauseum. Uh, that's what a number of people are fighting against these days. Uh, many of the regulations make our health care system really confusing. Uh, uh, to people, for example, uh, there are all kinds of regulations around prescription drug plans for seniors and, um, you know, seniors trying to uh, figure out you know, which plan is appropriate for them and, and why uh, have a difficult time and often need help with that. Uh, government prohibitions, obviously, we have lots of different uh, prohibitions. Uh, with the Affordable Care Act, there are plenty of uh, regulations on the insurance industry right uh, so and the insurance industry is prohibited from doing certain things for example the insurance industry now has to spend a certain amount of their money on health services and a certain amount on administration so you might you might think that's that's great they should do that 
but uh, by setting a certain limit for what you should spend on administration, there, there may have been uh, insurance companies out there who are actually spending a lot less. But then when you when you created a limit, they may say, well, you know what, we're actually going to spend more money on administration uh, by just paying ourselves a little more and we'll still meet the requirements of the government. So you might actually make the market, uh, uh, you might actually make the market worse uh, instead of better. But uh, the idea is that most of the insurance companies were, were spending too much on administration and not too little. And so that's why you create a law. But remember when you create laws, you're really creating them for the average situation. You're not creating them for the exception to the rule. And sometimes the exception to the rule can actually be one of the better performers. So some of your best insurance companies could have been exceptions to the rule. And now you might be bringing them into the average realm and making them actually perform in a way uh, that uh, could be actually more harmful instead of being better. Now also there's redistribution of income and that, that comes through taxes. So we're doing all of these in the U.S. So that gives you some sense of the degree of market failures that we have uh, in the healthcare market in our country. All right, so that's it for this week. Uh, again, as we said, as I said before, uh, just make sure you work on your draft papers. And if you have any questions, ask me, Professor Payne or Professor McDonald. Okay, have a good